Everyone look at this picture up front here. Have you ever compared the body types of a world-class sprinter to a world-class distance runner? No. Anyone? Okay. So look on the top and the bottom. What body would you rather have? Uh, either or. <laughs> both look nice. Okay, well, here's the thing. When you want to be successful in life, you've got to study people who are at their best in your profession. You always got to study the habits of the successful. So if 98% of the people want to look like the people on top, you got to study their training habits. You know, unfortunately, people look at this picture, or they don't even look at this picture, but too often you see people doing this steady state, long, excessive cardio. And yet, when they want to look at, when they want to get results, you know, they're not getting it because they're, they're just looking at the wrong idea. So you've got to find out what kind of body type you want and you've got to study those habits and you've got to train like them. Makes that makes sense. Yeah. I know. So what I'm going to talk about today is something called high intensity interval training. And it's kind of a mouthful, so I'm just going to say interval training. Just make it easy. So what is interval training? Interval training is basically where you alternate bouts of very intense bouts of exercise followed by nice relaxation periods. So you're going to go intense to relaxation. So for an example, you would go 30 minutes of, or 30 minutes, 30 seconds of all out exercise followed by a minute and a half of just rest. So rest interval followed by heavy and you keep alternating those. And this is contrasted to steady state cardio, where they're just going to go a steady slow pace for 30 minutes, for example. That's a pretty common workout they do. So they did a study and they compared the results of people who did high intensity interval training for 12 weeks versus people who did steady state cardio for 12 weeks. On the steady state cardio, they did 30 minutes three times a week. The high intensity interval training, they did 20 minutes three times a week. So they did less amount of time and then they looked at the results. And here, what you see is all of them, both groups, had very similar measures of weight loss. So they both lost about the same amount of weight. However, the interval training, where they actually built up their intensity, they had seven times the amount of fat loss compared to that, and this is just 12 weeks. Just 12 weeks, seven times the amount of fat loss. This is the kicker though, the biggest one. When you interval train, they actually, that group, gained two pounds of muscle. The steady state cardio group lost a pound of muscle. So let's see here. That's a three pound muscle difference. So not only are you not getting the results, you're actually losing muscle doing this exercise. And this is the American Academy of Sports Medicine. So the problem with excess aerobic activity, excessive aerobic activity, because you know, if you're at the gym, you know, you'll, I'm just going to pick on females for a second. You know, you'll hear, oh, I just did 45 minute light jog. And then, well, I did 55 minutes, you know, and it's like back and forth and they're going, they're bragging about the time they spent. They're getting it all wrong and they're never getting the results they want. See, the problem with excessive aerobic activity, and this can be half marathons, marathons, any time where you're just doing a steady state for a long period of time, which everyone does by the beach. I happen to see it every day, nearly you're going to have a decrease in testosterone, immune system function, muscular strength and size. We just talked about they lost a pound of muscle in the previous study. Okay, so they're losing that muscular strength and size. But they're increasing massive cortisol production when you're doing that. Because your body's not built to go 60 minutes of just slow, constant speed. We've never done that in our lifetime. Our ancestors have never just ran 60 minutes slow pace and that's all they do. They never did that. You know, if they were hunting, they would be sprinting out, then be resting, they would go here, there. It's always varying in intensity. They never ever just ran 60 <coughs> minutes of just slow exercising. Never happened, not once. And when you're increasing this massive cortisol production, that's putting you in the stress response. And when you're in that stress response, that means you're decreasing immune system function, you're decreasing brain activity, you're decreasing memory, and not to mention, that's the first cause of all chronic disease out there. Heart disease, cancer, everything. That's just the kicker. Because usually you exercise to reverse those effects. But when you're doing it this way, you're not getting the results you want. So anyone doing these, I guarantee you you're not getting the results. Because the research is clear. Now, I'm going to pick on some marathon running here. Because most people think that 
when you run a marathon, that's like the epitome of health, right? Yeah, like, right. that's my goal. I'm going to run a marathon. And that's cool. You know, like, I'm not saying, I'm not picking on people doing aerobic activity. In no way am I saying that. I'm talking about excessive aerobic activity. And that's not just do with marathons. This is probably anything over 40 minutes of steady state cardio. So you're going to actually have, when you're doing this excessive aerobic activity, a sevenfold increase in cardiac risk. But wait a minute, I thought aerobic activity was good for your heart. Right, right. Hmm, what's going on here? The London Marathon, since 1981, have you guys ever heard of like people who are pretty in shape doing a marathon, then they die, yeah. they collapse and die? Yeah. yeah, that's happened 11 times since 1981 at just one marathon alone in London. So that's a span of 30 something years, so that's not incredibly, but that's not that rare. 11 people in just a 30 year period, that's not that rare there. And this is just sudden death. This is not like collapsing, going to the hospital. This is just out because it's seven-fold increase in cardiac risk. So that's a little small. Um, we need to talk about muscle fibers. Now, this is going to be the real big kicker for today's lecture. You have three types of muscle fibers. We have slow twitch muscle fibers. You got fast twitch, and you have super fast twitch. You can also call it type 1, type 2A, and type 2B. You're going to see here that your type 1 muscle fibers, the contraction speed, I've kind of put it in red, it's slow. So that's why in aerobic activity, you're only using type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers. Because it's slow, they're highly fatigue resistant, you're not, get, you're not adding your intensity at all. So that's all you're using in aerobic activity is type 1 muscle fibers. See. Here's the issue. Your fast twitch muscle fibers make up roughly 60% of your muscle. Because a muscle has all different types of muscle fibers. So when people say, oh, this cardio is real good for my heart. Well, is it really? Because all they're really working is 40% of the heart. They're not even touching the anaerobic pathways, the fast twitch muscle fibers. So if you don't use 60% of your muscle fibers, how does that saying go? If you don't use it, you lose it. lose it. Exactly. So if you stop using it, you're going to actually have muscle atrophy. Mm -hmm. Hence that study I just shared with you at the beginning. They lost a pound of muscle in 12 weeks because they're not using 60% of their muscles. If you don't use it, you lose it. So aerobic exercise, you're only using your slow twitch. In anaerobic exercise, where you're doing uh, short bursts of like interval training, power lifts, uh, you know, usually doing weight training, you're actually engaging all of them. So that's what they found out. High intensity interval training engages all three muscle types. And we're just going to call it two muscle types just to simplify it, fast twitch and slow twitch. Does that all make sense everybody? Yes. Okay, good. Now here's a picture of a muscle. And you'll see here that if you take out the muscle and then you take a cross section of it, you're going to see all those tiny little muscle fibers. 60% of those fibers are going to be fast twitch, 40 is going to be slow. So. If we all do, the slow and then the is no, no, this doesn't show you which ones are fast uh -oh. or slow. This just, I'm just showing you how you have small muscle fibers that make up a muscle. And 60% of those muscle fibers are going to be fast twitch, 40 is slow twitch. Mm. So if you do what almost everyone does, steady state cardio, thinking they're, you know, lose weight and do all this, they're not using 60% of their muscles. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. You're going to be having huge amounts of muscle atrophy. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you look at those um, long, long distance runners, the, you know, the long distance runners, they're going to be very skinny, but they call it skinny fat because what's there is not muscle. It's fat, but they, they are skinny indeed, mm -hmm. but it's because they're burning all those calories and they're losing so much muscle. Mm -hmm. So here, right here, we're going to talk about the benefits specifically of high intensity interval training. And one of the biggest ones is increased growth hormone production. Growth hormone is key for health and longevity. When people get to around 30 years old, you have a dramatic drop in your production of growth hormone, a huge drop. And they call it somatopause. And that's why you see, you know, males in their 40s, 50s getting injections, synthetic injections, because your body's production drops so much. So what if we could find a way to increase it naturally throughout your life? Would that be cool? If you remember my last talk on intermittent fasting, you found out that just by intermittent fasting, you increase growth hormone production by 3,000% in males, 
2,300 in females. But then what if we combine the two? Okay, hold on. Now, after age 30, when your growth hormone drops, you also have insulin-like growth factor that drops. Because insulin-like growth factor follows growth hormone. And insulin-like growth factor is one of your anabolic hormones. It helps put on muscle mass, another one that's for health, longevity, but it keeps lean muscle mass on your body. So once you get to age 30, your natural decline of growth hormone, therefore insulin-like growth factor is going to drop too. So it's like a double whammy there. So we really need to find ways to increase that. So they did an eight-week study. And what they found out is that from eight weeks of doing high intensity interval training, they boosted growth hormone by 771%. And it's real simple, the reason why. Because you're, you're actually engaging the fast twitch muscle fibers that the steady state cardio people never touch. That's that easy. So when you're engaging the entire muscle and not just 40%, you're gonna be releasing a massive amount of growth hormone. If you're not releasing growth hormone, there's no way you're going to get you know, the lean muscle gains you want to keep lean muscle mass. There's no way. You can't do it. So what does HGH do? Well, it promotes muscle growth, fat burning, strength, longevity, anti-aging, healing growth repair. It does everything. It is like They call it the fitness hormone. So the more HGH you can produce throughout your life, the more robust and the more longevity you're going to have throughout your entire life. Not just till you get up to 30, but even after because you're going to stimulate that natural production. Another benefit, and this is going to be a little confusing at first, it reduces telomere shortening. Now to explain what a telomere is, inside a cell you have a nucleus. That cell contains chromosomes and those chromosomes have your DNA in it. At the end of each DNA you have something called a telomere. It's kind of like a little side piece and that aids in protection of the DNA, it keeps it from denaturing. So the telomere has protective properties. Well, what happens is that every time your cell divides, because our cells are always dividing, that telomere shortens and shortens and shortens. So when that telomere gets just to a short, certain amount, that's when you pretty much die of old age. So that you can actually tell how old someone is by looking at their telomere length. High intensity interval chaining reduces the telomere shortening. So that is one of the best anti-aging strategies you can ever find. And when you talk about telomere shortening, it gets accelerated by things like obesity, smoking, putting any toxins in the body, not doing interval training, you know, poor diet, you name it, that actually speeds up. So anything that's toxic, anything that you're toxic in or you're deficient in, it's gonna increase telomere shortening which basically is gonna mean it's gonna increase your death rate, basically. The guy on the left, anyone know who this guy is? Looks like Jack LaLanne. This guy is my hero. He is a 104 year old sprinting champion. 104, and he's still, 104, 104. And about a couple, about last year, he actually challenged Usain Bolt to a race. Oh, wow. But he actually holds the world record for the 100 meter dash among centenarians. I had to look up that word, it's people over 100. Yeah. yeah. And his world record of 100 meters is 29.83 seconds. Now it doesn't seem fast, but he's 104. Yeah. I mean, and so he's been doing this interval training all his life. So he's reducing his telomere shortening, has a lot of longevity. 104. Wow. Show me a person 100 in here. Yeah. You know, really guarantee you they're probably not walking. This guy's sprinting. Yeah. Well, kind of sprinting, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's also going to maximize your calorie burn. And the reason is it's something called EPOC. It's excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Basically what that is, it's the roughly the two hour period after a workout where your body's trying to recover back to its original state. So it's directly related to intensity. So therefore, the higher intensity of the workout, the more your body has to expend calories after the workout to build you up to pre-workout status. And so it has to do things like repair your muscle tissue that was damaged in the workout. You're always damaging muscles, but it's actually good to damage the muscles because it's put stress on them so they build. And it also helps to replace your energy and oxygen levels after your workout. So what this is gonna do is 
your interval training compared to steady state cardio, steady state cardio, you're not working very hard. You're going slow. People can have full conversations pretty much. So their epoch effect is going to be relatively very small. So they're not going to burn hardly any calories. Well, most people who do the steady state cardio, they're doing it to burn calories. So they're doing it, they're looking at it all in the wrong way. So you gotta do interval training to maximize your epoch effect so your body can spend a lot of calories after a workout to build you up to pre-workout status. So here, when you're looking at the types one, you know, you got the slow twitch on this side, the fast twitch on the right side. The slow twitch, the contraction speed is slow. So when you're running slowly, you don't need to do fast movements because that's all your type 1 fibers can handle. And also your force production is very low. So obviously they're not doing a whole lot of force. But then if you look at the other type, this is for fast contractions. It's for high force production, but it also fatigues very fast. It's not fatigue resistant at all. And that's why you can only sustain a high intensity exercise for maximum 30 seconds. If you can go longer, you're not working out hard enough. So that's why you're, it's not like you're going to be doing this intense exercise for a long period of time. All it takes is 30 seconds. So if we're talking about something here where you're going to dramatically reduce your training but getting exponential results compared to steady state cardio. And no one is doing this. So let's look at the other ones. You're going to optimize fat loss and strength because this is cool. What high intensity exercise does to you is it does something called intensity induced gene activation. So that intensity is actually going to activate, it's going to change your DNA. It's going to activate these genes promoting fat loss, muscle strength, because it, it activates these fat loss proteins in the body and you're just going to get this huge effect that way. So again, optimize fat loss and strength, increase muscle, increase growth hormone. So far we're on the right track here. Now we're going to talk about the other benefits here. You're going to improve cardiovascular health. In fact, among heart transplant patients, they did a study where they compared them. They put one regimen on a slow state cardio, another one on a more in high and in higher intensity interval training. What they found out is that the people doing the high intensity interval training among heart transplant patients, they actually were able to sustain low blood pressure throughout the time, keep it under control, and maintain better cardiac health. And this is among heart. So anyone can do this type of exercise. It sounds scary yet, but just wait until we incorporate it and we're going to get there. But again, doing this, heart transplant patients can do this, okay? This is pretty amazing. You're going to have greater endurance, speed, performance. In fact, recreational cyclists doubled their aerobic capacity in two weeks just doing this. Doubled. That's, that is unheard of. You cannot do that. And you're going to optimize your efficiency. You're only working out 20 minutes. You only need 20 minutes a day for this. You're not going to be at the gym for hours. 20 minutes three times a week and you will get better results than you've ever had. And again, the American Academy of Sports Medicine did a two-week study and they found out that in two weeks of interval training, it does an, as much aerobic benefit as eight weeks of slow state cardio. And again, remember, in the slow state cardio, you're actually working out 30 minutes three times a week versus 20 minutes three times a week. So you're working out harder and longer, not harder, but longer, but you're getting way less results. You can get the same result in two weeks rather than eight weeks. And you're also going to improve muscle tone, higher energy levels in libido, and increased production of testosterone. Everything we want. <laughs> so this is the cool part. How do we incorporate this? Well, the good news is that you can use all of these exercises right here and apply it to interval training. You can do swimming. You can do push-ups. You can do walking. You can do squats. And then you can use virtually any cardio equipment you have. Treadmill, the row machine, stationary bike, elliptical, any of that. So let's give you an example. This is the kind of, I'm going to give you kind of the workout I recommend. What you're going to do for the first three minutes is warm up. So, you know, if we're going to go for a, uh, if you're going to go on the elliptical, for example, you're just going to kind of go at a slow state because the last thing you want to do is go from rest to intense right away. Your, your body's not ready for it. So you've got to do a three minute warm up, just slow, just kind of build up that routine. Then, following that three minutes, all out for 30 seconds. And by the end of that 30 second period, you should be breathless. You should feel your muscles should be burning from that lactic acid. You should, you should feel like you could not go another second. And 
just a fair warning, after two, three repetitions of this, you are going to be sweating profusely. So then you're going to go right after that, you're going to go out a 90 second recovery period. And then that recovery period can either be slowing down on the elliptical or just stopping if that's what you need. And the whole recovery period is just to kind of bring your heart rate back down so you're ready to do it again in a minute and a half. And you repeat this about seven more times. Now for beginners or people who are you know, out of shape or just kind of intimidated by this, just start out with two to three sets of this. Just doing that alone, you're gonna get huge results. So just do intense exercise 30 seconds, relax for a minute and a half. Work out 30 seconds, relax for a minute and a half. You're done. If that's all you wanna to do to start off with, that's fine. But you're gonna get huge results that way because you're using all the muscle fibers and not just 40% of them. Now, let's use a uh, specific example. So let's talk about sprinting. Now, sprinting is more for elite athletes. You know, but again, sprinting, it's not about the speed. It's just about how, how, how much it's taxing your body. You know, if it's taxing your body a lot by going a very slow pace, great, keep it up. That doesn't, doesn't matter. doesn't matter because we can apply this to walking too. So for a three minute warm up, because sprinting so hard on like the hip flexors and the hamstrings in particular, you gotta do some stretches. And I prefer active isolated stretches, which basically you never wanna do static stretches before a high intensity exercise. Never static stretches. That could be good for after the workout, but actually is going to diminish your strength temporarily if you do. A static is where if I'm going to stretch my hamstring, I'm going to go like this, mm -hmm. hold for a minute. I do not do that. It's static, so that's why I'm not moving. Where, what active isolated is, it's I'm pushing down and then back. Down and back. So you're going back and forth. And that, because that prepares your muscles to go all out. If you do the static, that's actually a good post workout. A relaxation, yep. That's why in yoga, when they're doing the static ones, you don't feel too energized after yoga. You're like, I need to crash. So then, after that, you do the warm up with that, and then you're also gonna do foam rolling. I would recommend foam rolling of the hamstrings and that, because again, this is just an example of sprinting. Sprinting's pretty intense. So you're gonna do foam rolling on that, and then I recommend jogging lightly for one to two minutes, because again, you're not gonna go from rest to sprinting right away. You gotta build yourself up. So for a sprinting, it's probably gonna be a little bit more than a three minute warm up. After you stretch, foam roll, this is just an example, and then lightly jog for a couple minutes. Then all of a sudden, you're gonna run as fast as you can for 30 seconds. Following that, you're gonna rest and walk for 90 seconds. And again, this is very, very flexible. If you go all out for 30 seconds and after a minute and a half of walking, you don't feel like your heart rate's gone down enough, Take three minutes rest, take four minutes rest. It does not matter, it does not have to be like this. This is just an example. I like, I work out at lunch, so I don't have a whole lot of time. 20 minutes is all I get. And so this is what I do. And this is what I personally recommend. And I also recommend, it's easy for me because I live right by the beach, but going barefoot, because then you're gonna be duplicating your effect because you're gonna be absorbing those negative ions from the earth's surface. And especially if you go by the wet sand area, the water acts as a good conductive agent. It's gonna really help facilitate that flow of negative ions to the body while you're sprinting, while you're increasing growth hormone, while you're doing all of this. I mean, I personally like a lot of benefits in less time. And then for your post-workout, you're gonna recover. Now, I recommend probably three days in between this initially because your body needs, needs to recover. Because when you work out all those muscle fibers, remember that EPEC, EPOC effect is so high that your body, it actually lasts a lot more than two hours after the workout. Your body is constantly trying to regenerate itself, repair that muscle tissue, add more oxygen and energy, re replace your ATP stores in the body. That burns a lot of calories. So you've got to recover for at least two to three days. That's why you want to do no more than three times a week of this. You know, so you can do like a Monday, Thursday, Saturday or something like that. That could be a good routine. Walking. So if high intensity interval training, I know the word sounds scary, but if it seems for people, you know, maybe the elderly or people who are out of shape and are just getting new to a program, if it feels like it's a little too daunting to attempt this, you can do it with walking. And what they found out, the ja there was a study, um, the Japanese did a study and they found out that just by doing three minutes of walking fast, followed by three minutes of walking slow, and alternating that for about 20 minutes, you gained way more results than steady state walking. And that's obvious after everything we've talked about already. 
but you can do it with walking. So those of us who like to walk, I like to walk, do this and you're gonna, you're gonna multiply your results by 10, at least. I mean, it's amazing. So those who like to walk, you can apply this to any exercise you can. Now, three weeks ago I had to talk about intermittent fasting. And again, when you're talking about intermittent fasting, for those of us who are new and don't remember that or weren't there, that's where you restrict your eating window to eight hours a day. You don't restrict calories, you just restrict your eating window. So for example, I only eat on weekdays from 12 to 8. 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. is when I eat. And so at 11.30 when lunch hits, I've actually been fasting now for 16 hours. And remember, all right, let's back up, because I gotta kinda review this. When your body's utilizing energy, it first, is go, it first go after your blood glucose and your muscle, um, your muscle glycogen. After that's gone, then your body goes after its fat stores to burn. It takes approximately six to eight hours after a meal to burn all that blood glucose and all that muscle glycogen. So after eight hours after a meal is when all those energy stores are depleted, so your body's forced to go after fat as its energy source. So people who are eating six small meals a day, they're constantly replacing their muscle glycogen and their blood glucose. So they're never even touching their fat stores, never. That's why people who are doing six small meals a day aren't getting the results. And there's not one research article to support that, even though everyone's heard it, everyone's doing it. It is a complete myth. It doesn't avoid starvation mode. You don't keep your palpable high. If you eat a 2,000 calorie meal in one meal versus over an entire day, you're gonna burn the same amount of calories eating that meal. So, if I'm fasting for 16 hours and then I work out in a fasted state, not only am I burning way more fat, I'm producing way more growth hormone. Now, you might be like, well, dude, I'm gonna be pretty lightheaded if I work out in a fasted state. If you're not used to it, you, will be, you might feel a little low energy for the first week and then your body adapts fast. You lose the hunger cravings, it's fine because your body's gonna be more efficient now at using fat as fuel and not your carbohydrates, not your blood glucose and your blood sugar and your muscle glycogen. So if you actually did apply both of these together, they go hand in hand, you are gonna be multiplying your results by thousands. You're gonna be literally superhuman. It's gonna be quite amazing. So I invite you guys each to try that. I'll be around for any questions, but you gotta combine these two. If you want the best results, applying very little effort. And again, you literally will be superhuman if you do it. It's awesome.